we have Dr. Andreas Plazas, and he's an astrophysicist working at Princeton University and the Rubin Observatory. So thank you so much for being our presenter tonight, Dr. Plazas, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Denise, and thank you very much for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Um, okay, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight at uh, Science in St. Louis. It's my, my pleasure to be here. And uh, today we're going to be talking about exploring the universe with the largest digital camera in the world, uh, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Um, but I thought that I would start telling you a little bit about myself. So um, I was born in, in Bogota, Colombia, in South America, and I studied physics in the um, University of Los Andes in Bogota. And then for a few summers, I had, a, um, I had the chance to do an internship at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory uh, close to the city of Chicago. And then I did uh, my studies of my grad studies at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And after that, I moved to Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island to work for, for a few years. Uh, then I also had the chance to work at the um, Jet Propulsion Laboratories and NASA Center managed by Caltech. And then a few years ago, I moved to St. Louis to work with the CosmoQuest project of citizen science that I encourage you to, to Google if you want to do some cool citizen science. And uh, currently, I'm an investigator and associate, an associate researcher at uh, Princeton University working with the Rubin, Vera, Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And of course, I currently live in St. Louis, where I um, usually uh, partner with the Academy of Sciences in St. Louis. I co-founded Astronomy on Tap in St. Louis and um, Science is Still, so you may have heard of it. And I encourage you to, to attend. Um, okay, but uh, today I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna talk about the Rubin Observatory and um, I will start by giving a general description of, of this project. It has uh, four subsystems. It's a, there's a telescope uh, a site. There is the largest digital camera in the world. There is a data management component and an education and public outreach component. These are the main subsystems of, of this project. And at the same time, there are four science drivers. Uh, so we want to know about the solar system. And we want to know about the Milky Way. We want to know about all those objects that change in the sky on relatively short scales, uh, which we call the transient and variable sky. And uh, we want to know about dark matter and dark energy. And um, we, of course, we're going to learn a little bit about uh, Dr. Vera Rubin. And, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the techniques that uh, I use personally in, in my work to learn more about dark energy and dark matter, which is called gravitational lensing. Well, um, okay, the mission of the Rubin Observatory is the, cons uh, the construction project is to build a well understood system that provides a vast astronomical data set for unprecedented discovery of the deep and dynamic universe. And uh, these two words, deep and dynamic, usually are in opposition to each other. Usually we build telescopes to look into galaxies that are very, very faint. That's what we mean by deep. And we usually build other types of telescopes to look for objects that change in the sky on the scales of days or weeks, which is what we call the dynamic universe. But here we want to build a facility that actually gives us a data set in which, with which we can do these two type of, of, of scientific objectives. So the observatory itself is going to conduct a, a project, a survey of the sky, which is called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST. And I'm introducing these acronyms because we're going to find them in, in the talk uh, lately. And uh, put it in the words of one of the architects or one of the minds that uh, conceived this project. Uh, we say that we basically put an optical camera on an eight meter telescope with a field of view of the size of 40 full moons. And then we use this camera to take 1000 pictures of every area of the visible sky over 10 years. This is the, basically the scope of what we want to do with this uh, LSST survey at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. So this is a little bit of foreshadowing of what we will see as the focal plane of the, of the actual camera. You can fit 40 full moons. And uh, we're gonna learn the significance of this because 
uh, this is actually a very, very big area of the sky uh, to have to be imaged with a digital camera of this size. So the, as I said before, this project um, uh, has been in the in, in the works for since, since the, the 2000s, even before. It was actually conceived as what it was called the Dark Matter Telescope at the beginning. Uh, then in 2010, uh, it was selected by the, the National Academy of Sciences as the highest, prior highest priority for ground-based uh, astronomy in the United States. Uh, this is a process that happens every 10 years, and right now the National Academy of Sciences is producing another report in which they tell uh, the astronomical community what should be what the priorities for astronomy should be in the next 10 years. And then Congress and NASA and other agencies read this report. Um, then the project started uh, construction in 2014, and uh, hopefully construction is underway, and then we will we will see. Uh, what the status of, of the telescope is right now. So this is a, an observatory that is being built in Chile, in the northern part of Chile, uh, close to a town called La Serena, in a mountain called Cerro Pachón. So looking a little bit closer, you actually, to get there, you need to fly to Santiago de Chile, then you fly north to La Serena, then you drive about 50 kilometers on paved highway, and then another 40 kilometers on, on dirt road. And then you find the uh, um, uh, facilities that are owned by an American consortium of universities that is called the Association of the Universities for Research in Astronomy. Or, and this is one of the reasons why this site was chosen. In addition of the excellent quality of the site, the infrastructure was uh, already there with other telescopes. So there are also economical reasons in to, to choose a site like this, to put a telescope like this. Uh, this is a, a view of the... Um, of the mountain. Um, it's a mountain about 2.6 uh, kilometers above the sea level, which is uh, about 8,000 feet, uh, more than 8,000 feet. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is one of the best uh, um, sites in the world for optical astronomy. You usually want to be in a site that is dry, in which the, there, are, there is not a lot of turbulence. And in the southern hemisphere, you can find that site in the northern part of Chile, which is a desertic site close to the Atacama Desert. In the northern hemisphere, you find such a site in the islands of Hawaii, for example. But this is for what we call optical astronomy. There are other types of uh, telescopes we use, use different wavelengths, such as radio, that are not affected as much by, by clouds. So you can actually put them in, in other sites. But for optical astronomy, this is one of the best uh, sites in the world. So the, the first subsystem, the telescope at site, um, includes the telescope itself, as well as all the buildings and facilities needed to support the operations and maintenance of the, of the observatory. So this is a, tele, a, a project that is being built from the ground up. And um, it's building a telescope, which is called the Robin Observatory Simoni Survey Telescope. And uh, it features a unique three mirror, three lens uh, optical system that we're gonna see in a few slides and features the world's largest uh, uh, digital camera. CCD here is the name of the sensors that are used. And it's a technical name. It stands for charge couple devices, but uh, you only have to know that that's, those are the actual sensors that are used in this, in this camera. So, as, uh, as we said before, this is the largest digital camera that is ever built, and it's, uh, uh, it's about the size of a small car, and it weighs, about, uh, it weighs more than 6,000 pounds. And uh, here are other, other numbers about this camera. It's a, it's a camera that has uh, 3.2 gigapixels, or as you can see there, it's 3,200 million pixels. Uh, it has... Uh, to about 200 of these individual sensors that I mentioned, these CCDs that are uh, um, grouped into 21 drafts or mosaics of nine CCDs. So we hope to be able with the LSST uh, survey um, to detect about 40 billion objects. And uh, of those about 5 billion of them will be, will be galaxies. Um, this is just uh, an schematics, just to give you an, an idea just uh, about the size of, of the camera. You can see a schematic of a person of, of five, uh, five, five, 1.65 meters. 
And uh, we have here a better schematics of, of the camera. If you pay attention to, to the left, as I said, you have a series of lenses, of optical lenses in this camera. And then you have uh, uh, your focal plane and you have a grid of CCDs. All these 200 CCDs are assembled in, in a focal plane. And then you have a system of filters. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those filters and what they do in, in just a little while. And then on the right, you can see uh, the way that light comes. We want a, a, a big mirror. The, the diameter of this mirror is about eight uh, meters, 8.4 meters. The bigger the mirror, the, the better, because we can catch more light. And then through a series of bounces, it actually focuses the light into the camera. Then you need the lenses in order to correct the path of that camera so that it falls on the, on the detectors. And this, once the light falls on those detectors, then they become electrical signals that are being read by our computers. And then we are able to actually work on with this data uh, in, in any part of the world. And we're, we're gonna see about this in a few seconds. So as I mentioned before, we have the filters. And what's happening is that we have our focal plane of our 200 CCDs, and we put a filter of a certain color, which that means is that we let pass, for example, only red light or green light or blue light. And when you look at a galaxy at a different filters, actually the galaxy looks different. And it is because there are different physical processes that emit at different energies or at different colors. And then by doing the comparison of how the galaxy looks like in all these different colors, you can learn a lot about the galaxy. In astronomy, we're actually um, confined to the earth. We cannot put a galaxy in the laboratory. We can only just capture whatever light we get from, from the sky. But if we do things like this, in which we look at the galaxy in different colors, we can learn, for example, how far the galaxy it is from us or we can learn about what the composition of the stars of the galaxy, uh, of the galaxy uh, are, what these compositions are. We can also learn if the galaxy is moving far away from us or is moving towards us. So that's where we wanna look at the same galaxies in different filters. But in a perfect world, actually, something even better, we would take the light of each galaxy and we would pass it through a, a system of lenses and a prism and we would actually split the light of the galaxy and this is what is called the galaxy spectrum and then we would analyze that spectrum and look at those uh, the, un, a, a galaxy spectrum that you can see on on the right so it's like looking at a rainbow of the galaxy that has certain lights certain dark lines and uh, this is how you learn about the, the composition of the galaxy, because each one of those lines is telling you about uh, a particular element, for example, hydrogen. And then if you compare how those lines move for different galaxies, we can tell about the distance of the galaxy. So it would be great if we, would, if we could do this for every single galaxy, but we cannot because it would be very expensive, actually, to do it for every galaxy. Remember, we're aiming to measure 5 billion galaxies. So instead of that, we actually have to just take a pictures of the galaxies in the in different colors. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show some uh, real pictures of the lenses of the galaxy. This is a camera that has been that is being built in, uh, in one national laboratory uh, that is owned by the Department of Energy of the United States. This lab is called uh, Slack Linear Accelerator, which is uh, close to Stanford University in California. Uh, but this is actually a consortium of um, several universities and labs, even outside of the United States. And then the mirrors, for example, were polished in, in Arizona and the University of Arizona. And this is an example of the, of the mirror. So as I was saying before, um, to give us an idea of how big the camera is, you can think of it as being as big as, for example, a, a car, which is a, a small beetle car. But uh, I found it funny that a colleague of mine at uh, Slack, Margot Lopez, actually came out with a, with a kind of funny metric. And she said that you could actually fit 240 corgis, corgi dogs inside the camera. I don't know how she calculated this number. <laughs> probably assuming that each corgi was some sphere. This is what physicists do. We, are, we use spherical cows, and in this case, a spherical 
corgis. But it's just a, a funny way of thinking about the size of this camera. Anyhow, uh, this is a, a close up of the actual detectors. So on the left, you can see these little mosaics or wraps of nine detectors of the CCDs. And then in the center, you can see a type of electronics that this camera has. And then you can start realizing our, uh, how complex the, the functioning and the, the functioning parameters of this camera are, actually are, because you have all this electronic, they have to be actually cooled down to a minus 100 degrees Celsius. Um, because that's the way these detectors should work. And then all these conditions actually make it very challenging to make such a large mosaic of, uh, of CCDs, of digital detectors. This is one of the reasons what I was saying why this is a very challenging problem to put together all these detectors. And just until now, this technology has been uh, achieved in recent years. These de detectors, these CCDs, they were invented about in the in the 70s, more or less, in the 60s, and they actually replaced photographic plates. This was a huge advancement in astronomy, and uh, this was an example of, of how technology allows us to extend our senses, our eyes, and when we have a better technology, it opens a completely new window of the universe. And this is what happens with the invention of the CC in the 70s. But then it took all these decades in order for us to manage the cost to build such a, a large camera like this. This is the final camera assembled at uh, Slack National Laboratory, a close up of, of the picture. These are some corner rats, and then you can see some detectors that are a little bit uh, up, uh, like uh, out of out of line, and that's actually on purpose because that gives you information about about the stars, and it helps you guide the telescope on the sky. And these are pictures that were taken recently on the of, on a, a press release that happened a few months ago. This is a picture of a Romanesco um, broccoli. I think they wanted to to show like a fractal structure or something like that. This is a picture of Dr. Vera Rubin. And then again, we have uh, more pictures of the, of the camera and then in, in relation to, to the full moon. And then as I was saying before, you can put about 40 full moons in here with a squeezed resolution. And uh, this is the camera, uh, again, on the lower left is the camera that I just showed. But I just wanted to mention that this is the next generation of other types of cameras that in recent years have been built and have been producing similar surveys to what LSST will, will produce. So on the right, you have what we call the dark energy camera, which has uh, about 500 million pixels. Remember that our camera has uh, 3,200 million pixels. And on the top, we have another camera that was built by the Japanese and it's on, on Mauna Kea, on a Subaru telescope. So this is an example of these large CCD mosaic cameras that are the precursors to this uh, LSST camera. So I wanted to show a simulation with the dark energy camera. This is not the LSST, of course. Um, and I'm sorry, this is not a simulation. This is actual data. And it's just to give us an idea of the type of survey and the type of scale that, we, the, that we're dealing with. So you see that in this case, the focal plane of the dark energy camera is like an hexagon. And then you take an image of, of the sky little by little, and then you tile the sky little by little and little by little. And then you can see all this amount of data and all this huge amount of objects that we can see with this project. And this is just one eighth of the sky that you can see in Chile. This, uh, this is from a telescope that is actually very close to the telescope where the LSST camera will be. And uh, it gives us a glimpse into the future. And uh, we're gonna actually have even better quality data with, uh, with the LSST. And this is giving us an idea of the quality of the data that we're gonna find. Like this is uh, a picture of, uh, of an area of the sky with photographic plates that they have been digitized. Then uh, this is a, a picture of, uh, of a CCD camera that of a survey that happened in the two, 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 2000s, which is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey of LSS, uh, SDSS. And uh, 
then this is a more recent survey um, that actually has a better quality and is actually comparable the quality with the, what we will see with the LSST camera. And then we're gonna see a simulation of, um, this is a simulation of what we're gonna see with the LSST camera. And then you can see how objects start to pop up. And this is what we mean by the deep sky. If you stare at a certain area of the sky and then you give it more time and more time, you start gathering more and more light there are caveats, of course, because then your image is going to be noisier, or you might have some mega constellation from some company passed in front of you because you're looking at more uh, in more time. But you can see that as the quality increases, as the quality of the technology, we have a, a sharper image of, of the universe, and we can see more objects, and we can see the fainter uh, sky. And this is what we want to do. This is just a, another simulation of the LSST camera. And, um, and here I wanted to, well, I wanted to move to the second um, system of the, of the Vera Ruin Observatory, which is, which is the data management subsystem, right? That, so I, wor I actually work for the data management subsystem because the, the amount of data that is going to be produced with this camera is what we, we call big data. And then you need to actually come, it needs to be a, a subsystem of the project itself in order to be able to write software to manage all this data and uh, to make it available to the a community, to the professional community in the United States and in Chile and in the world, and also to the general public. But I also wanted to show on the right a more uh, realistic view of, of, of those detectors that I showed before, that they look very pretty. But in, in actuality, there are a lot of effects that you need to get rid of from, from these detectors. This is, a, as you can tell in the middle, you see somebody in the lab testing the camera. They took a picture, and it actually looks very nice. Uh, believe it or not, because the, if, we, if we didn't see anything, it would be bad, because that would mean the CCDs are dead. But here we can see the image, but we can see all these little artifacts. And uh, part of my job is actually to write software in order to get rid of this type of, of artifacts. Um, okay, so this is a data. So the data are taken in, in Chile, in La Serena. And then, then the other problem is how, where are we gonna analyze this data? So you need to put it on the big internet cable that goes through to, there's a cable that goes to Brazil, another cable that goes to, to Panama, then it makes it to the United States. I think if this is a faithful picture, it makes it to Florida. And then currently the data um, are coming to a National Center for Supercomputer Applications in Illinois, the University at Urbana-Champaign in, in Illinois. Um, there are also partners in France, and uh, this is also part of the data management system to try to see how to coordinate all this data how to move the data from one place to the other and to make it available to, to the astronomical community. And then uh, one of them, another subsystem of the project is what we call education and public outreach. And this is a very important part of the project because usually in projects in science, uh, you, don't, you don't find EPO or education and public outreach as a part of the project that has been built from the ground. And uh, what this means is that now this project has dedicated funding and this is very important because nowadays most of the funding from the Rubin Observatory comes from public funds. It comes from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy in the United States. It had the initial private funds and that's why the telescope has the name of uh, some rich person. But uh, now almost 90% of, of the telescope or of, the, of the whole project or more than that is being funded by, by the public, by you. So it is very important that uh, we actually make this data available to the community and that we invest in, uh, in producing uh, a product in which anybody with a computer can access this data. And um, actually the, the EPO subsystem of the Ruin Observatory is building uh, specialized products so that if you're a teacher in high school or in mid school or even in a university, if you want to do a project with, uh, with your students, you can do so. And uh, even if you right now Google the EPO component of Vera Ruin Observatory, you're going to find projects that are already uh, starting to, to, to be out. 
Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before in the introduction, there are four uh, science goals, the main science goals in for the LSST that is going to be con gonna, will be conducted by the Rubin Observatory. So the the first uh, science driver is to learn more about dark matter and dark energy. Uh, we also want to know about the solar system, what's out there in the in the solar system. We want to know about the Milky Way and the evolution of the Milky Way. And we want to explore what I said, what I call the transient sky. So what, what do we mean by this? So we want to uh, do a catalog of the solar system. We want to actually have uh, repeated observations of all the objects that are in our solar system, in our neighborhood. And uh, one of the main reasons is because, and a very important reason, is what we want to detect what we call near Earth objects, objects that are by definition close to us, and moreover, those objects that are actually potentially dangerous or hazardous. And uh, there was actually a mandate by Congress in 2005 that astronomers needed to detect all more than 90% of the objects larger than 140 meters in the solar system by 2020. Um, didn't happen, no? And part of the reason why it didn't happen is because of lack of funding. But that uh, that goal is still there, and uh, is one of the goals that the Rubin Observatory wants to help uh, achieve. But um, well, this is a very practical reason, but we also want to know more about the objects at the edge of the solar system that I can tell us, for example, about the origin of the solar system, what we call trans-Neptunian objects. Or even there is a hypothesis that there might be another planet in the solar system that is called Planet 9 sometimes, or Planet X. So there are some data that seem to support this hypothesis, but we need data, uh, better data, more data that can help us uh, tell apart between if this is a, a true hypothesis or not. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, we also want to study the Milky Way, our galaxy. And, and as we go through these science objectives, I want you to think about the different scales we're going through actually, because we, the solar system is, of course, uh, a huge place compared to to human scales, of course. But that's why it takes us uh, years to go from one place to the other, no? months if we're lucky. But here, I was just talking about the solar system, but now here we're actually at a completely different scale, at the scale of, of the galaxy, which is a completely huge, huge gal uh, galaxy. And we're in one of those little arms of uh, about 8,000 kiloparsecs away from, from the center of the galaxy. Um, but th this is one of the other uh, science objectives that a project like this will, will let us uh, accomplish. And we want to study um, the Milky Way, and we want to also study the local neighborhood of the, of the Milky Way. You can see this same picture here. You can see it here in the, in the center. And then you can see a completely different scale of about what we call 80 kiloparsecs. So, one light year, uh, three light years is about one uh, uh, one parsec. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, another science driver is the um, the transient sky. So it's the the changing sky. So we want to actually do observations of the sky every three days. This telescope is going to come back to the same place in the sky, and we want to detect those things. Those um, processes in the universe that change on the scales of days. And for example, explosions of stars that we call supernovae. And there are objects that are very, very far away that are called quasi-stellar objects of quasars. Or there are other objects that are associated to black holes that are active galactic nuclei. There are a lot of objects that uh, are, we call transient objects and uh, that Actually, they just explode, and then within a few days, they their light just fades. So you cannot do that with a telescope that is just looking at one place in the sky and then comes back to the same place in in a week, in well, in six months or something like that. You need to come back to the same place with a very, very, very high uh, cadence. And uh, and I just want you to give an idea that we're basically trying to do everything with a single telescope. You know, this is something unprecedented in, in astronomy. As I said before, if you want to look at the solar system, you build something. If you want to look at the transient sky, you build a dedicated telescope. If you want to look at the deep sky, like you want to look, as, as I mentioned before, at the largest scales in the universe, then you actually have to design another project. But here you want to build an exhaustive 
uh, uh, you want to build a project that will conduct an exhaustive survey of the sky with which you can do all of this. Um, so another driver is uh, dark energy and dark matter and cosmology. So one, one of these, uh, these circles uh, contains 10 million galaxies. And well, let's back up a little bit. When I say cosmology, here we're again at a completely different scale from a galaxy. So here we're talking about cosmology by definition. Physical cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole using the scientific method. And here galaxies are actually the points of the cosmic web. The minimum, the minimum unit or the basic unit in cosmology is a galaxy. It's just a, a dot in a simulation in the cosmic web. And I'm gonna show you in a few slides what I mean by the cosmic web. But with this, we wanna, we're wanna we talking about the Big Bang. We're talking about the origin of the universe as a whole. We're talking about what uh, what will the fate of the universe will be. This is the type of, of things that we're talking about in cosmology. And uh, with the uh, LSST, we're gonna observe about, uh, well, half of the sky, which well, we live in a, in a sphere, but from Chile, you can only see half of the sphere. So in other words, all the sky that you can see from Chile this half of, of your sphere, you, we're going to observe it. So that's why we say half of the sky, about 1,000 1, times every patch of the sky over 10 years. And we're going to produce a huge amount of data. As I said, we're going to catalog about 40 billion objects, but we're going to use about 5 billion of those objects to produce a catalog that will uh, allow us to learn about two mysterious components of our universe that we call dark matter and dark energy and more of that in, in a few slides. But before we continue, I wanted to talk a little bit about Dr. Vera, Vera Rubin. So Dr. Rubin was born in Philadelphia in 1928, and he went to, she went to Vassar College um, back in the time, um, and, and up to this date, uh, she, uh, women faced a, a lot of adversities in, in science. And uh, one of her high school teachers actually told her, well, as long as you stay away from sciences, you should be fine. No, this is the, the kind of things that, that, that she, she recounts in, in after that. Uh, one of the things that she said is that, that she knew uh, an astronomer, an American astronomer called Maria Mitchell. And uh, she knew that there was a school where women could study astronomy. And then it never occurred to her that she couldn't be an astronomer. And that's the importance of the power of, of representation. Well, after that, she went to grad school. She wanted to apply to grad school. She wanted to go to Princeton University, uh, but they told her that women could not be accepted in the astronomy program. And uh, it wouldn't be until another 25 or 27 years after that, that they would accept uh, women at, at Princeton. Uh, but she ended up going to, to Cornell. Uh, she ended up going after that to Georgetown at Cornell. She actually studied with uh, under Richard Feynman, a very famous physicist. But even at, at all these stages in, in, in her career, she really faced a lot of challenges because people were really doubting her, her job, her work. Uh, were telling her that uh, she was married and she had kids, that she's like, wives don't belong in this environment. And unfortunately, these are problems that are still faced today by, by women, by women of color and by other uh, underrepresented minorities in, in physics and astronomy and in other STEM fields. So Vera, Vera Rubin, she used to say that, uh, that she, she was interested in astronomy since she was a, a, a little kid. No? She would stay all night lying in her bed, looking at the stars, and she was fascinated by, by this, right? She would rather do that than, than go to sleep. And she had this fascination. And uh, because, yeah, we're all fascinated by astronomy. You know, we should all be able to, to study astronomy and, and not because you're this or that, then you shouldn't be able to, they, they tell you that you, you can do it. Well, but what, what did she do actually? So one of the, she, she was a pioneer in, with a lot of revolutionary ideas, especially in particular with the study of the universe as a whole in cosmology of the largest scales of the universe. But one of the most important uh, um, ideas that she came up with is with the co experimental confirmation of what is called dark matter. So back in the, in the 30s, there was a Swiss astronomer called Fritz uh, Zwicky or Zwicky, I don't know, I never know how to pronounce. 
but this person was working in, in California at Caltech. And uh, in the thirties, he measured a group of galaxies and then he measured how they're moving around. And then he said, there is not enough mass to hold together all this cluster of galaxies. They're moving so fast that this cluster should be just flying apart. And then he said, there must be some type of matter that I cannot see. And he dubbed it dark matter that is binding everything together with gravity. But then it wasn't until the, the 60s or the 70s by the work by Vera Rubin on the scales of galaxies that further evidence was pr produced by, by her in favor of the existence of, of dark matter. So she actually, she didn't measure clusters of galaxies, you know, like several galaxies together as like, like Suiki, but she actually measured individual galaxies. And then she measured the speed, the rotation speed of the stars around uh, the, the galaxies. And uh, then the physics, you know, the no normal physics that, you know, will tell us that this speed close to the center at the beginning, it should increase. If, you, if, you, if you're at the center and then you start moving far away from the center, the speed should increase. This is what the laws of mechanics tell you. But then after that, the speed, the rotation speed of the galaxies should diminish. This is something that we see in the solar system. If you see the, the, the rotation, the, the orbital velocity of Mercury is going to be faster than the orbital velocity of the Earth or of Jupiter that are farther away from the sun. And this is just the way physics works. But she actually found out that uh, the speed of this rotating stars did not go down and this is what we see with those little points with the with those bars that that's the data so the data would tell her actually that the speed would not diminish and this would favor the existence of some extra component extra hidden mass or maybe not hidden something that you cannot see that is actually providing gravity in such a way that the speed of the galaxies of the stars around the galaxy doesn't diminish and this provided um, more evidence in favor of the existence of dark matter. So she was found with a lot of resistance, of course, but then with time, nowadays, this is the accepted view that we have in the universe, as we were going to learn. And today, uh, so we have a quote of, of Vera Ruin said that people actually was not very happy. People were not very excited about this, but uh, data are data, you know, if you're a good scientist, it doesn't matter what you believe, you need to pay attention to evidence. And uh, today, the, the picture that we have is that every galaxy is surrounded. You have luminous matter in a galaxy, all the pretty pictures of the galaxy that we've been showing so far. But every galaxy is surrounded by, you call it, by what we call a halo of dark matter, which is this type of matter that we don't know what it is, but it doesn't interact with light, it, with electromagnetic radiation. A better name would be maybe transparent matter. But um, this is a type of matter that doesn't absorb or emit electromagnetic radiation or light. But we can know that is there because of, of, of gravity. And uh, because it does interact through gravitational uh, attractions with, um, with other particles. On the right, you can see our actual data of two clusters of galaxies. You have two two uh, sets of clusters of galaxies, and then they were colliding with each other. And the dark matter actually doesn't interact that much with what we call the regular matter, everything that we find in the periodic table of the, element, of the elements. And then we would expect that dark matter would just go through in a collision of galaxies, but then the gas or the normal matter would actually show like a shock wave. Like if you shoot a, a bullet into, a, into an apple, you see like a shock wave. So this is what we see in this uh, image that we, you see the gas. And then what it says DM is the dark matter. But then, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> then you're gonna ask me, well, if we don't see dark matter, how do you know that that's dark matter? So please hold on a, a few seconds. The answer is gravitational lensing. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. But, um, but yeah, um, we'll, we'll learn about that in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, but, um, Okay, so every galaxy has this halo of dark matter, and then we have millions of uh, hundreds of millions of galaxies in the universe. 
and they actually form what they cluster together. So they, we, they form what we call the cosmic web. This is what I was telling about. We're thinking about a completely uh, scale, different scale here of the hundreds of millions of light years in which each uh, yellow bright point that you see here, there are clusters of galaxies and within, within each cluster of galaxies, you have more galaxies and these are halos of dark matter. And then you find these filaments of dark matter. And then between the filaments, you find what we call the voids or under dense regions. And this is what we call the, the cosmic web of, uh, of the universe, of the large scale of structure of the universe. So this is a nice poster by, by NASA that you can Google in, in the JPL website. It's what we call the, the, the cosmic web, la red cosmic in Spanish as well. So a lot of scientists believe that uh, the contributions of Vera Rubin actually should have deserved a, a Nobel Prize, but she never got it. Uh, uh, Dr. Rubin actually died uh, a few years ago, I believe, uh, five years ago or maybe, maybe less. Um, and the one way actually that's part of the reason why uh, this observatory was named after her. So before the whole project was just referred as LSST, but now last year actually, it was renamed by the National Science Foundation in honor of uh, Vera Rubin. Uh, this is the first national US observatory to be named uh, after a female astronomer. And then um, Vera Rubin herself. So she, all these quotes that we have been seeing is, how in hindsight, in the, when she did interviews in the 90s, she got a lot of other prizes then at the end of her career, not the Nobel Prize, but people actually recognized uh, the, the value of her contributions. But then at the same time, she used this voice to advocate for women in astronomy, uh, recognizing the, um, the struggles that uh, even up to this day, uh, women face. And this is a generalized problem in, in astronomy and physics, right? If you look at the Nobel Prize in physics, there are only four women total out of the 118, 19. And this is a little bit of, uh, out of date uh, um, picture of, of a newspaper. Uh, and then even if you look at other axes of diversity, if you look at the women of color, for example, there are no black Nobel laureates in science, no, period, that's it. And this kind of data are actually showing you the existence of a systematic um, of, of a systematic problem in society that it's also propagating in, in astronomy. And uh, just until recently, the, um, um, the professional associations, for example, the American Physical Society and the American Astronomical Society, the National Academy of Sciences, they're using data like gathered with uh, sound methods by social scientists and scientists uh, in which we can visualize this. And uh, these are two examples of two, of two charts in which you see that there's just a, that, that, we, that white women and even, even worse for women of color, they're disproportionately underrepresented in physics and, and astronomy. And uh, this is just a reflection of the systemic racism and white supremacy in society that has uh, permeated uh, 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 um, the um, astronomy as well and physics. And this is something that Vera Rubin actually inspired us to fight uh, against. So um, this is one of the things that we also have to think about when we, we talk about uh, Vera Rubin. But then uh, talking, talking again about dark matter, no? so I, I was saying before, how can we see dark matter if we, if it doesn't interact with anything. So the answer is what we call gravitational lensing. And what is gravitational lensing? It's just that it's the deflection of light by any distribution of mass in the universe. It could be a star like the sun in this case, it could be a galaxy, it could be a cluster of galaxies. And in this cartoon that we, hear, we see here, we see in the background the light from another star that is actually coming on its way to us, but when it passes close to the sun, it actually gets bent by the existence of the sun. So that's the, the two sentence explanation, right? But this is actually an idea that uh, was conceived by Albert Einstein and in mathematically you know, is, is given mathematical uh, soundness with his general theory of relativity, which is the best theory of gravity that we have. But for our purposes, we just think that there is light 
of background galaxies or stars that can get bent by foreground objects like like um, for any distribution of, of mass. It doesn't matter what type of mass it is. And this is the key. It doesn't matter what type of mass it is, including dark matter. So we call it gravitational lensing because it's analogous to what a lens does. Actually on the, on the right, you can see a wine cup and you can see a candle and you can see how the light of the candle gets distorted depending on how you put the, the lens to the left or to the right. And this is a, an analogous phenomenon that we see, but with gravity. And uh, this is not a theoretical exercise. Of course, this has been observed. These are real images from the space, from the Hubble Space Telescope, in which you can see these arcs are actually galaxies that are in the background, but they're aligned in such a way with other galaxies in the foreground, the, um, the yellow um, ellipses. And uh, then you can see this, um, this ring, this arc, because of the distortion of the, of, the, um, of the light from the background galaxy when it passes close to the galaxy in the, in the foreground. And then the key for, for us to know about dark matter is that if we measure the amount of that distortion, we can learn about how much dark matter is, uh, is there and, and that is causing that distortion. If you distort it less, then you have less dark matter and, uh, and so on. That's the, that's the idea. These are other examples. There's the, the happy, pay, happy face that I like, I like to show, like a, a cosmic accident. And then on the right, you see a cluster of galaxies and then if you squint a little bit, you can see a pattern, a coherent pattern of, of arcs around the center of the clusters of galaxies. And then again, by actually doing this with all, all the, with a, in a very, very wide area of the sky, with a wide area that is going to be allowed by, the, by these wide CCD cameras, we are going to be able to construct a map of dark matter. So if we measure the gravitational lensing signal in all these hundreds of millions of galaxies, how they are being distorted by dark matter, we can actually start making a map of the distribution of dark matter of the, and the clumpiness of dark matter in the universe. And then we can start create a map of the, of the cosmic web of the large scale structure. This is another uh, rendition, another, this is a simulation of the cosmic web that I showed uh, a few slides ago. And then, um, then uh, by, by doing this, then, then we can start building our, our idea, our cosmological model of, of the universe. So um, the cosmological model that uh, we have today is we say that the universe a long, long, long time ago, actually, is, it was all very dense and very hot. This is a, a phase that we call the Big Bang. It, it wasn't an explosion. It's, it's just a an unfortunate name, but it was just that at, the Big Bang means that at some point the universe was very hot and dense. And then the universe started to expand and then cool down. And then as the universe expanded and, and cooled down, then you would expect that actually the expansion of the universe would diminish with time because there is gravity that is actually um, bringing together everything you know in the same way that when you throw a rock to the sky then because of the gravity of the earth the rock goes a little bit with certain speed but it starts to decelerate decelerate and then at some point uh, it would come back so it was actually very surprising uh, when in 1998 actually it was discovered that the universe is not slowing down with time, but it's actually um, undergoing a, a period of accelerated expansion. So we have the, the Big Bang, we have the universe that is expanding. It was all very hot and very dense. The universe is expanding. This happened about 13.7 uh, uh, billion years ago. Uh, the Big Bang, but then about, about 5 billion years ago, the universe actually started to expand faster and faster with time. And this is the most counterintuitive uh, thing ever. And then again, coming back to our analogy of the rock that we throw to the sky is like, at some point the rock starts decelerating and then you're happy because you're gonna catch it again, but then out of the blue, it starts accelerating upwards and then you don't know why. So then again, we don't know why. And then now we're gonna add another component to, to the universe, which is what we call dark energy. We don't know why. So physicists 
and astronomers, they say that there must exist another component of the universe that is causing this accelerated expansion. And uh, actually, um, we're going to see, so this sounds crazy, but it actually agrees with the data. So one of the most important uh, data sets that we have in cosmology is a baby picture of the universe. There is something called the cosmic microwave background, which is uh, an, like the aftermath of the Big Bang, when everything was so hot and dense. And then at some point, this is something that you can measure in all parts of the sky. If you measure in the right uh, frequencies, you can measure this picture of when the universe was about 400,000 years old, which of course, uh, now you're gonna tell me, Andres, you're calling this baby. Well, if you compare to 13.7 million, um, billion, I'm sorry, years, then yes. So it is it is a, 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 the, the baby universe. And then this is what we see on, on the right here. And then those colors uh, between red and blue, there are fluctuations in temperature. They're very, very tiny fluctuations, very, very tiny, but we are actually able to, to measure them. And these fluctuations in temperature actually gave rise to fluctuations in, in gravity in such a way in, in matter that in certain parts of the sky, for example, where it was hotter, there was more, more, more matter. And then from that seed, more matter attracts more matter and more matter. And then you start creating more matter and then you start forming the, the clusters of galaxies and the large scale structure of the universe that, that we show, that we, that we have shown before. Okay, so this dark energy. So we have two components. We have dark matter and we have dark energy. We have this dark matter that we don't see it. We, we see its effect in the rotations of galaxies, in the clusters of galaxies. And dark matter is actually trying to create the large scale structure of the universe. It's trying to put everything together. But dark energy is actually trying to push everything apart. So this is what is called like a cosmic tug of war. And then um, one of the main objective of, of the LSST, which again, initially was called the dark matter telescope because we actually really wanted to know what this dark matter is. Um, one of the objectives of LSST is to give us such a huge data set, as I said, and we're gonna measure all these billions of galaxies. We're gonna measure the gravitational lensing signal, all the distortions. We're gonna make a map of the distribution of dark matter. We're gonna make the in invisible visible. And then we're gonna see how that distribution of dark matter changes with time along the universe. And uh, then if we have more dark energy, for example, then we're gonna see that we see less structure, it's gonna be less clumpy, but if we have less dark energy, then dark matter wins. And then we can quantify this, then we can quantify that there is more structure in those maps of the cosmic wave that I showed. There are, mathematical ways of actually putting a number to, to more and, and to less. And then it can tell us about how much dark energy we have, how much dark matter we have. We have. So currently we don't know what dark energy is, but we think that it's a component that doesn't change with time, that it's everywhere, that it's, uh, it permeates uh, um, all the space. Uh, the density is very, very, very low, but on very large scales, it actually starts dominating. And uh, the data are actually consistent with, with this, but, but we don't know. Again, all, all these names, dark matter and dark energy, they're placeholders because we don't know. It's just that the data are consistent with the simplest model that we have to follow so far. But uh, learning about the nature of dark energy, if it changes with time or not, it actually can tell us about the future of, of, uh, of our own universe. So here we, we have uh, a cartoon of, of the universe. If we go to the lower left corner, we have the Big Bang. And then in the, um, in the horizontal bar, we have time from the Big Bang to now to the future. And then on the vertical bar, we have the size of the universe. So as the universe was expanding, then as I said, is when you throw the rock, then everything expands, but the speed of the expansion diminishes with time. And that's what you call deceleration. It's what, when you do in your car, when, when your speed diminish, goes down with time, you call that deceleration. But then at some point, about 5 billion years ago, we started the acceleration of, of the universe. And then depending on what dark energy is, we might have different fates of the universe. We might have an internal expansion if it's just a constant dark energy. 
we might have that energy that can really actually changes with time this is one of the questions that we want to answer with this service like is it a, a constant or not it may sound simple but it actually will tell us a lot about uh, dark energy if we have a lot of dark energy it could be that it could rip the then even the fabric of a space time and that is what is called the big rip but maybe it will just decay maybe it's just a component of the universe that given enough time is just it's just weak or it's just going to decay it's going to change in such a way that it's going to disappear and then maybe there will be enough dark matter to actually bring everything together in the future to a big crunch and by the future i'm talking about a long 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 time but these are uh, things that we can tell with our mathematical models depending on the contents of of the universe so to summarize uh, nowadays dark energy and dark matter we know uh, using observations and using our mathematical models, they combine together that about 75% of everything that, that is in the universe. So like 95% of what there is in the universe, we have no idea what it is. It's what we call the dark sector of the universe, the hidden dark sector of the universe. Everything we see, everything we see on Earth, what we call the ordinary matter, is just 5% of, of that universe. So this is one of the most important um problems in modern physics the nature of dark energy um well this is under the assumption that the theory of gravity that we have actually is the is the ultimate theory of gravity we know that that's not the case but it could be that actually we need to modify that theory that einstein gave us that uh, so far that theory has passed every test that uh, people have ever done but we want to actually test the theory. We want our job as scientists is to make our theories fail. We want to come out with experiments to we can falsify these hypotheses and then discover new physics. So the other option is that maybe there is no dark energy. Maybe we have other. We need to modify um, the theory of gravity that we have. Okay, so. The standard cosmological model of the of the Big Bang plus the dark matter and dark energy, it, it agrees extremely well with observations because now you're going to tell me, Andres, so you're going to come up with some weird idea of 95% of the universe, you have no idea, and then you physicists put that by hand in your theory and, and that's it? No, well, we do that because that actually it agrees with observations. In the end, if evidence is, tells us something different, we just update our mind and we change our opinion and then we will be happy to do so and uh, as i mentioned before one of the greatest sources of data that we have of the universe is that picture of the baby universe the cosmic microwave background and then that cosmic wave is a cosmic uh, web or the large scale structure of the universe that you see on the right is the is a picture of an of an adult universe you can think of it right and then in between, that little green arrow in between, that's our mathematical model. If you have these initial conditions, and then we have our, our cosmological model, and then you turn on the machine, the mathematical machine, the machine is going to give you a prediction of what the universe should look like today. And the thing is that that machine that I'm calling that model, if you give it dark matter, if you give it dark energy, and if you give it all the other physics that we know, the standard model of particle physics, uh, then it's going to tell us actually that, yes, that it is consistent. With what we observe is consistent with the existence of these two components. That doesn't mean that that's the ultimate answer because that's why we're still doing it. What happens is that we need better data. We need the beta data of the type that LSST will give us in order to tell if we need to change uh, our theories or not. So then again, to summarize, we wanna, with the LSST, we wanna learn about our solar system. We wanna learn about the transient sky. The sky. We wanna learn about the Milky Way and our galactic neighborhood. And we wanna learn about the distribution of dark matter in the universe and the dark energy that is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. And then again, dark matter plus dark energy are 95% of the components of everything that there is nowadays in the universe, which makes it one of the some two of the most fascinating problems in, in modern physics and cosmology. And then to finalize, I wanted to show a, a current status of the of the telescope. So on the right, you can see a rendering, a computer rendering of the telescope back in, in the time, 2012, not that old, but still. And uh, on the left, you see an actual picture of the of the telescope in 2019. 
Uh, then you see that the, in the first quarter of last year, people were all excited and actually the first light was supposed to happen this year. Um, and then you see all the mirrors were, were shipped there. The camera actually finalized in, the, the camera is still a, a slack in the United States, but a lot of the components are already there and they're being built by Chilean engineers and uh, other contractors from other countries, including the, the US. Um, then these are other pictures of, on, on the, of the construction of, of the dome. Like everything was on, on track and what we call the integration, which is putting all the four subsystems together, you know, uh, that's, that was going well. Uh, but then of course we had uh, the, to shut down because of COVID-19. So in, in March, everything was uh, vacated and just until now, um, there are some progress again, but then again, we have another peak on, in, in cases of COVID-19. So traveling to Chile is being restricted and uh, this is uh, of course impacting the progress of, of the project. Uh, some other subsystems actually have gone ahead like the data management subsystems. Some people can do are very lucky to be able to work remotely. Um, but uh, in general, the project has suffered, of course, with delay because, you know, yeah, it is what it is. No? Safety goes first and, and the universe has waited billions of years and it can wait a little bit more. Uh, to finalize, I wanted to read uh, a, a quote by Vera Rubin uh, that she gave in a commencement address in, in Berkeley in, in 1996. And Dr. Rubin told us, I hope you will disdain mediocrity and aim to excel in whatever you do. I hope you will love your work as I love doing astronomy. I hope that you will fight injustice and discrimination in all its guises. I hope you will value diversity among your friends, among your colleagues, and unlike some of your regions, among the starting, the starting body of the, popul of pop the starting body population. I hope that when you are in charge, you will do better than my generation has. In 1993, U.S. universities awarded PhD degrees in physics and astronomy to a total of nine black Americans. You do better. And uh, we hope to do better. And with that uh, inspiration from Dr. Rubin, um, I wanted to say thank you. And I will be happy to answer your questions or try to or direct you to somebody else if I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Plazas. That was a fascinating presentation. And I, I love the quote at the end and the use of corgis. So Natalie, who's also here with the Academy, she's got two corgis. <laughs> so I'm sure she loved the corgis as well. Um, looking at some of the questions, let's see, Jeff wants to know when putting a telescope on, I'm probably not saying this quite correctly, but Mauna Kia in Hawaii, mm -hmm. There is a lot of contention between science and culture because the mountain is considered sacred by native Hawaiians. Is there similar contention in Chile about building telescopes on mountains? And also will the SpaceX Starlink satellites affect LSST observations? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. And one of the cameras that I showed, the Hyper Supreme camera for the Japanese, uh, it actually had to stop because of the protests. and. Uh, this is something that uh, just uh, until now, we astronomers and physicists, we need to start to think more about and actually do this in a proper way because the way that it has been done so far is in, in a colonialist way. And uh, it's my opinion that we actually should uh, talk to the local communities that, to acknowledge that it's their land. And then, I mean, if it doesn't work, we'll just go somewhere else. And that's, uh, there was another mountain in, in Spain where they wanted to move the, there was a telescope that they were going to build, it's called the 30 meter telescope. Uh, so we could have just go to Spain and, and that's it. Uh, in Chile, I think they're trying to have a more mindful conversations with the local communities. I don't think there's some, um, I haven't heard a lot of, of that, but I wouldn't be surprised if actually, I don't know, like they, they're so, minoritized by now and disenfranchised by now that they don't even have a voice. And this is something that, that yeah, I should uh, maybe look more and see what's actually happening. I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised being from, uh, in particular from Latin America, it happens in my country as well. Uh, the indigenous population is very disenfranchised. And um, if you look at the numbers also in the United States, you see there are no, I don't know 
of, I don't know of indigenous astronomers, for example, there are a few, but personally, I, I don't know. So uh, as I was talking about uh, before the, the challenges of women, of white women, of women of color, then you have all these people, then you have other minorities, and then all these challenges uh, affect all of these minorities and uh, you need to we need to change that system that systemic racism and colonialism um so yes i would say that thank Regarding, you oh sorry the second question oh, yes <laughs> about the starlink actually yes. this week we have the it will be affected so this week we have the american astronomical society meeting online uh, this meeting actually happened in san luis like a couple of years ago or one or two years. And these slides that I'm showing, actually, I was attending a talk right before this talk that I'm giving. There was a session, a special session about astronomy satellite constellations. And there were there was a panel of representatives from a star from the astronomical community from uh, uh, SpaceX. Uh, and there's there's also a rich guy from Amazon wants to do one Kuiper Amazon. And then there is one web, I think. So there's going to be thousands of these these things, and they, they they've been trying to to talk to um, to talk to the companies, right? And then they have done. The, I have colleagues like Tony Tyson, one of the minds that behind the Dark Matter Telescope and the LSST has been publishing, has been working a lot on this, and there's a paper on on this. And one of the things you can calculate is that. Uh, how bright these things are going to be in such a way that they're going to saturate our detector. And when I say saturate, is that you can think of a pixel as a bucket of of light, and then saturate is that you get have enough uh, so much light that it just starts spilling out. But um, so they, they, there are things that they have found out, right? Like maybe if you this is a picture that they show that you do the simulation and then you do the math and then the, you can tell that if you send the satellites to 500 kilome kilometers is better than if you send them to 1000 kilometers so there are things like that or if you code them you know spacex has like a, a new generation of satellites that are called the visor sat or something like that in which they have been coded in in dark paint and they have been able to diminish the brightness of these objects in such a way that do you see them with the naked eye but the problem is with all these faint galaxies if you want to see billions of galaxies you need to look at very very faint galaxies and uh, we have an instrument that is designed to look at these faint galaxies and it's not enough that you cannot just see it with your eye and that's it so the, the, there are algorithms there are ways to to get rid of satellites there there is you can do you can write code and, and do it but up to a certain extent because there are other science applications that actually is not going to be enough to just remove this with with a uh, with some code. And one of the most exciting things of the LSST is the things that we haven't discovered. I think this data set is going to show us the unknown universe that we haven't discovered, and we don't know how this is going to be affected. And then lastly, one of the other just one panelist that they had like eight people, and just one person was actually telling them about the ethical aspects of this and how the sky belongs to all communities that it seems that is just American companies that decided that they have the money and they can just take over the sky. So there is this other aspect that is related to the first question, first question about how the sky belongs to all of us and how it has belonged to all the cultures around the world. So that's also that also should be part of, of the conversation. And then they concluded in the end with the need of having an international body for regulations but um, you know well we have the international astronomical union and then we have the un but well there are reports i mean i think uh, there are reports there there are uh, this satcon was like a, a conference that happened a few weeks ago and then the report also produced a rep the un produced a report on dark and quiet skies of worship so i encourage you to to look at it it is a big problem thank you um, let's see. Michael would like to know, will AI and machine learning be used to process all the data coming in from the telescope? Um, techniques. I know the techniques in, in artificial intelligence and, um, um, and machine learning will be used to analyze the, the data of the telescope and 
and uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, this has uh, this is a field that has been developed uh, uh, immensely throughout the, the the last few years, and in in uh, almost everything that you want, you can um, apply ma machine learning, right? And that's we definitely a lot of my colleagues uh, this week. I, there were a lot of talks about using machine learning techniques in astronomy. Then uh, there was another plenary. Um, there was a plenary speaker in the American Astronomical Society, a colleague of mine that works at Fermilab, and his name is Brian North, and he's one of the persons behind uh, um, um, shut down academia. There was a movement this year, uh, given the uh, the horrible things that have happened uh, against the black people uh, in the United States, and uh, in his plenary, he was telling us that he's an expert in in artificial intelligence, and then was. Uh, he was talking about exciting things about using like self-driving telescopes. Like our projects have become so complex that now you it's better if you use machine learning to tell us what type of experiment we should be doing. And then to, uh, to have the telescope just drive itself. So there's a lot of these cool things. You can do classification of galaxies and stuff like that. But then there are also the moral implications. And like, if I have the power to improve a machine learning algorithm that is gonna improve the detection of galaxies, then uh, uh, what's my moral responsibility in giving that to the world? Because then somebody's gonna come and it's gonna create some racist AI, which we already know, and, you know, we're, we're training our machine learning or our AI on, on bias sets. And then it's some city says that I'm gonna use machine learning to identify people who commit crimes, and then uh, it's gonna be biased towards black people and, and minorities. And this is a fact. This is a, has already measured. So, so there are all these these aspects. And uh, the answer to the question is yes, uh, but we can do it. Should we do it? Is one of the questions that my colleague uh, Dr. North asked. But uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, we have time for just a few more questions. Mm -hmm. And let's see, Deep Chica would like to know, what is dark matter? And not, in de not in definition, but physical characteristics instead. What does it look like? And if it has ever been seen? So we don't know what it is. So it's, um, again, it's a placeholder for a, a component. Um, we know about the characteristics of dark matter, which is that it must be something that doesn't uh, uh, interact with light or more generally electromagnetic radiation. Uh, there are candidates. Uh, so we think that it might be, so that by definition, it could be, it's, it's anything that you don't, you don't see, but it pro produces gravity. So at some point in time, people thought, oh, maybe there are these tiny objects that we actually don't see, maybe some stars or something. But then you do the math and then you compare it with the, with the data and it's not enough to account for it. So um, some of the leading candidates for dark matter is that it's a fundamental particle. That's, um, and then by, by a fundamental particle, I'm talking about something like a proton or uh, even smaller than that, you know. And uh, it could have different characteristics, you know, it could have different masses, it could have uh, properties of, interaction that interact with itself or not. And if you look at the literature of dark matter, you're gonna find a lot of, of models. And there are a lot of experiments based on, on these models. No? Some of them actually you, uh, go to underground mines and then try to look for the recoil of these dark matter particles with the nuclei of, of, uh, of a certain material, you know, of, uh, of regular matter. Um, because one, one candidate is called the weakly interactive massive particle. And the weakly part is that uh, it, in, it interacts with normal butter, but just in a very, very weak, weakly, weak, in a weak way. So uh, there are experiments like that and uh, that go on in underground mines or they use very cool down temperatures in order to quiet down the, 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 the intrinsic movements of the lattice of atoms. And then you can see those type of recoils. Uh, also, you can look for it in astrophysical processes. You can, with gravitational lensing, actually, the, the, the model tells you, you have the hypothesis of dark matter and it should create a certain numbers of clusters of galaxies. But then 
with gravitational lensing, you are able to actually count those numbers of galaxies. And then recently people have found that there are discrepancies in the model or not. So it's, it's a guessing game, but it's an educated game. And then, then again, there are candidates, there are like uh, weakly interactive massive particles, other ones are called axions. So they, they have all these names, but these are the, the main candidates that, that we have. Thank you. Um, let's see. Karen would like to know, how do you filter out satellites? And with numerous satellites like Star, uh, and will numerous satellites like Star Starlink impact your pictures, if at all? Uh, right, yeah. So I, as I said, um, it, it also depends on the type of science that you want to do. Uh, there are certain, and depends on the brightness on the satellite and uh, uh, as I explained before, some of them are going to saturate your detector. Some of them, even if uh, you don't see them by the eye, the detector is actually going to see something very bright. And we, we've had to deal with this as astronomers in the past. Like, for example, a plane is creating a, a streak, you know. And there are mathematical ways of, of doing that. There are algorithms in, in imaging. Uh, an, an algorithm is just a recipe or a piece of code that you follow that can tell you uh, you can identify a, a line in an image, and this is not only in astronomy. And then once you do that, then you do some mathematical transformation, and then you use the information of the pixels that are not affected by, by the trail, and then you can recover the, the original pixels, you know? So there are ways, but then depends on how precise you need to, to measure, no? So there are other applications in which you don't have that luxury, you know. One of the easiest ways, actually, if you took two pictures of the of the sky, and uh, one picture, like a in a consecutive manner, one picture is going to have the satellite, and maybe the other picture doesn't have it, and then maybe you can create a difference, and then that's that's easy. You can get rid of that. But there are other ways in which you only have one image of of the sky, and then then that's it. Then you lose those pixels. Or you may be able to apply your algorithm that recovers, or you think recovers the pixel, but then for the science that you're trying to do, I don't know, this, this is not the particular science that I'm, I'm doing, but it could be that for the particular science that you want to do, it's not enough. So it's, it's gonna be a big problem, especially because now we're gonna have tens of thousands of these things in the, in the next few years. And there's no regulation, no? it's just, it's part of the problem. Thank you. Um, a few more questions. Michael would like to know, how will the LSST data differ from data? Uh, how will the LSST data differ from what data will be coming from the James Webb Telescope? Will those two data sets, optical versus infrared, be compared? Um, so uh, the, J the JWST is a space telescope that will be launched hopefully this year. and. Uh, it has a different wavelength, as, uh, as it was said. It's called the near infrared. Um, I haven't heard too much about synergies between these two data sets, uh, but I do know that uh, LSST um, will be able to be used with other with data sets from other space uh, telescopes. One of them is the the next flagship telescope that comes after JWST, which is called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope by NASA, uh, before it was called W first. So a lot of my colleagues actually and myself, I have worked on this project and, and definitely there are ways in which they can complement each other because LSST, for example, has all the area that you want, the whole sky. A space telescope, it is very hard to get something in a space and you usually get better quality because you're in a space, but you get a smaller field of view. Although the Nancy Roman telescope is going to have a relatively large field of view with respect to what's already there, no? the Hubble Space Telescope. It's going to be like a hundred Hubble's. But still, uh, you can you can complement that, right? You can see how these two data sets can complement each other. And, and we're going to do it in particular in, in weak lensing as well. And the European Space Agency is actually going to launch another telescope um, early in the next, I don't know, maybe next year or next year, which is called Euclid. And it's also using weak lensing. And uh, for the particular types of science that you want to do in cosmology, you need all this large area. And I don't think James Webb is going to do like a large uh, area survey. 
uh, as opposed to the next telescope, the Roman telescope and Euclid telescope. So the answer is like with JWST, I'm not so sure. There might be some science cases, but I'm not aware of. But definitely with other space telescopes, there are synergies and we want to do that. We want to combine the power of all these data sets and do a combined analysis, definitely. The more data, the better. Thank you. All right, and then the last question of the evening, um, let's see. When will the telescope be fully functioning and producing images and data? Um, so we were hoping that by this year, by the end of this year, we were gonna have what we call the commissioning period. You have the integration period where you put everything together. You have the commissioning period uh, when you check that everything is working, then you have the science verification period in which you check that you can actually get the science that you want to. But due to COVID, and uh, it hasn't been announced officially, but unofficially, the, we say that there's a, a delay of one year due to the pandemic. So I would think that by 2022, the end, or 2023, we're going to start taking the data. Uh, the good news is that in six months, it's going to take more data than everything else has been taken so far, like other surveys that I showed. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is delayed because of the pandemic. So I would, I would say the end of 2022 or um, 2023, hopefully. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Plasas, for such a face fascinating um, presentation. I enjoyed it. And um, for those of you that attended, thank you for attending tonight. And please, if you have a few moments, complete the link to the survey monkey that's in the chat and let us know um, how we can improve and what you thought about this science in St. Louis. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Have a good night.